Thank you, Jane. Thanks. Oh, well, y'all, this is a, an interesting lesson. I wrote two words up on the board, prophecy. I would have written speaking in tongues. I didn't have room. <laughs> so <it's laughs> speak in tongues. Uh, but today's lesson is called Others, Not Self. And this is the third lesson in this series. It's the first one in our quarterly, the series. The series is about worship that pleases God. And it's the time of history in about the first century AD. Christian churches were just being formed uh, in homes and they were establishing worship practices. Um, unlike the Hebrews, or the first Christians did not have a set of laws. They didn't have uh, any kind of plan that told them how to organize their worship, how to act, how to play, how to dine, how to dress, how, what holy days they should have. They were kind of making this up as they went along, and they were working on it and trying to find what they should be doing. They were finding their way. They were experiencing worship through faithful examples and trying to follow the teachings of preachers like Paul who had set out what he believed were best practices for their letter, through letters and his own preaching. Well, lesson one taught us about the need for both public and private worship, while lesson two described, described the need for humility that will allow the practice of authentic worship. Well, today's lesson presents the idea of using our gifts to build up the church and make worship more valuable to everyone present. The examples that Paul will use will be uh, what's going on in the church of Corinth, and he will talk about these two things. Well, the city of Corinth, uh, if you, if I walk over there, I'm out of the frame, so I'll just tell you. You know how Greece has a big place at the top and a little isthmus in the lower part? The little isthmus is where Corinth is located. Uh, the Peloponnesus is to the south, and then mainland Greece is to the north. But y'all, it was a territory. It wasn't a country like we know, so you know maybe that's not even here nor there. Uh, the city had a really bad reputation. It was a major seaport, and I wondered if the negative stereotype of the drunken sailor may have added to their infamy. I don't know about that. But while they cherished Athens as a city, an educational city of Greece, Corinth was really the most important city that was under Roman control. And that was because it was a crossroads, east, west, north, south, a lot of trade. And ships came into the port, and interestingly enough, they didn't dig a canal, but they did over portage, maybe that's the word. Uh, they drug sleds across that isthmus to the other side to port there to move on to the west, to the east, west. I'm getting my directions wrong. And so north and south and east and west, there were a lot of people coming in there, a lot of different ethnic groups, a lot of religions. So it was just kind of a bustling center at that particular time. Uh, it had a lot of traffic of people that didn't live there but were coming and going. Commerce was extremely important. Uh, the location made the city a wealthy place. There were a lot of very, very wealthy people and very diverse people. And these were people that enjoyed luxury and immorality. So it was like a fertile field, I guess, at that time to work. Uh, when a Corinthian was portrayed on a stage play, they were always the drunk. Does that tell you something? It was so sad. Uh, since they drew their wealth from the sea, the most important god, you would think, would be Poseidon, the god of the sea. But actually, their big worship was to the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And in Athens, they had a temple to her, and they had over a thousand priestesses of love, if you get my drift. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> needless to say, they probably deserved their bad reputation of what was going on there. It really probably was a sin city. Uh, did any of y'all grow up in or near what was called a sin city? Not a Phoenix Phoenix Where? Phoenix City. Oh, Alabama. I have heard Phoenix City. <laughs> <laughs> Phoenix City, okay. Miami. Miami. Although I know people said that was a beautiful place it to grow was. up. It, it was. was. Okay. It was. <laughs> but anyway, we hear that. Uh, needless to say,
say this church uh, was looking for maybe some changes or needed some changes. I grew up in a county, and the county north of us was called Tipton County, and we always said, that was, oh, that was really bad. That was a bad place. I'm not sure it really was. <laughs> Who knew? I mean, I grew up near a naval base, so we were, <laughs> they were probably talking about us at the same time as a Sin City. Uh, the thing is, these people, when you had a young church in this, this kind of atmosphere, it would be pretty difficult. Here we are at first century A.D. Corinth, and, and they were wrestling with what to do and what was going on. Uh, all these members of the church came from different backgrounds, different, but primarily they were Greek, they were Roman, and they were Hebrew in the church. Uh, but other ethnic groups were mixed in. They were coming from religious backgrounds that were different, and most were immigrants. Most of them were poor. Most of them were poor. The few rich members that were there often thought of themselves as much better, and they wanted to take charge because they were wealthy and they thought they should be in charge. So these were some negative influences that were going on. Well, Paul had spent 18 months in Corinth and he helped start a home church there. And then he continued to correspond with members of the church. And the first Corinthians is really a letter that Paul sent as a reply to a letter sent to him complaining about all the things that were going on in the church that some people didn't like, and obviously he didn't like either. There were a lot of concerns. We don't have that letter, so we just have to kind of extrapolate what he says to them and assume that was an area of concern or something that was going wrong or that they shouldn't be, you know, be doing. Uh, our lesson is going to describe the concept, concept of spiritual gifts. Uh, and it teaches how and when two specific gifts are to be used during worship. The NIV Compact Dictionary of the Bible says that spiritual gifts is a theological term meaning any endowment that comes through the grace of God. It goes on to state that these gifts were given for special tasks in and through the church. Well, while our verses are Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, there is a list there of spiritual gifts. Wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Well, our lesson is going to focus kind of on those two specific gifts, prophecy and speaking in tongues. Uh, before we explore this, and I put it up there, Gosala Lathia, I have to look at the pronunciation, is the word for speaking in tongues. Let me ask you this, has anyone ever spoken in tongues? No one, okay. Have you ever been in a church where they did that? Oh, one, good. Do you remember it? Yeah, it was frightening to me. <laughs> <laughs> did somebody interpret what those people said? No. Okay, we will find that, that that's a critical part of it. Uh, that, that really must be done. Uh, has, have any of y'all ever spoken prophecy? No, but no prophets in here? Have you ever heard anybody get up and say they were prophesizing? Yeah, well, of the two, Ken said, I speak in tongues all the time. <laughs> and I said... They probably think my lessons are speaking in tongues. They don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I try not to do that. Well, these are unique gifts, and they're interesting. And they, you know, at first I thought, well, my goodness, these are the gifts that, you know, most of us are not that familiar with now. You know, well, I don't know why they put that in there. But overall, what Paul is talking about in this lesson is including everybody. And I think you'll see that when he talks about how these gifts are to be used. Uh, those are not truly a problem in our church. And I, I read something interesting, y'all. It is just since 2015 that the Southern Baptist Convention has allowed missionaries who even admit that they have spoken in tongues. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my, well. And I really never thought about it. But it, they said it has originally was the first question on applications. And if you, originally, if you said yes, the application went in the trash. But now, they are maybe open to this, which I, I just thought was kind of interesting. 
one of the important things about these gifts and all the gifts is that they are, need to be used to support each other and to lift up each other. We have communal worship and it should include every member and lift up every member. And this is what Paul was telling the church at Corinthus. Spiritual gifts should be used in a way that doesn't exclude anyone. It should be accessible to all. This is still the way we want worship to be in our modern church. A time to lift up everybody and to include every member. Really, no one should be made to feel less important than another person. And at every point, all through 1 Corinthians, Paul makes it clear that worship is for all believers. The gifts of prophecy and speaking in tongues makes excellent examples for what he is talking about and what he's explaining. I'm going to read verses, uh, well, 15 through 17 is, is in our lesson, but I'm going to back up to 13 and help it make a little bit more sense. This is 1 Corinthians 14, 13 through 17. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. What should I do then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing praise with the spirit, but I will sing praise with the mind also. Otherwise, if you say a blessing with the spirit, meaning in tongues, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving since the outsider does not know what you are saying? For you may give thanks well enough, but the other person is not built up. Okay, amen, which we say all the time, but in point of fact, it meant it is true or so be it. And if no one is there to interpret the prayer in tongues, and they were supposed to be prayers at this time, they were supposed to be prayers, well, they're not learning anything from the prayer. They don't know anything. Um, some Bibles use the word edified, which just means that they've not learned or they aren't improved by speaking in tongues. Uh, Charlene and I worked with a fellow who spoke Cherokee. Do you remember that? <laughs> and he... I don't know what topic he was going to do for a group, but he said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to start speaking in Cherokee and see if anybody recognizes what I'm talking about. And nobody did. Mm -hmm. Now his father, was it his grandfather? I think it was his grandfather was Cherokee. And well, I was pretty amazed because he spoke to us and I was like, what the heck is that language? I have never heard mm -hmm. that. So, but possibly he was, I don't know what he was elaborating on, but in point of fact, it would be like somebody coming in here and speaking Cherokee to us. We might not know what they're talking about. It doesn't do us any good, and that's what Paul is saying to them. Yes. If you don't have somebody to explain this, yes, ma'am. Um, I thought one of the things in the lesson uh, where this couple had gone to um, one of the cathedrals in Europe, I can't yeah. remember, and when they were all to say the prayer in their own language. And but they were all saying the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, yes. right. But they, they were to, to use their own language, and I thought, that must have been really interesting. Well, that would have been, but no matter what language you were speaking, you understood it. Right, sure. And everybody else did because they knew what you were talking about. But, you know, I thought it was interesting if the people are getting up and, and there's no interpretation, well, that just really doesn't mean much to you at that time. Um, Paul suggests that a person speak in tongues in private unless he or another person can explain the language and speak with his mind. Now, in some verse, some Bibles, they'll talk about speaking in the vernacular, which was whatever language was your language. Um, when I taught school, you know, we kind of pounded in these poor kids that uh, Latin was the language of Rome. But in point of fact, everybody pretty much spoke their own language, the vernacular. And uh, even today in Italy, uh, Italian is the language, the cultured language, the educated language. And people speak in different vernaculars that, I, you know, I don't know if you've heard it 
and you spoke Italian, you would understand. You probably would know some of it. I don't know. I don't have a clue. But anyway, an interpreter is important. Paul goes on to say that speaking in tongues has a place in worship, but it should not be abused. This is Corinthians 14, 21 through 25. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. Yet even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. Oh, let me stop here because I went, oh my, let me get this straight in my head when I first read it. Uh, they, they're a little confusing without an explanation. Paul is quoting from Isaiah, and he is, and what he is saying is that the children of Israel, and this is God speaking, the children of Israel have rejected his message. So he says, well, I'm going to speak to them in a foreign language. And that foreign language was the language of the Assyrians. They invaded and spoke to the Israelites in the Assyrian language, which they did not understand. So it's a little bit different than speaking in tongues, but it's an interesting concept. It goes on, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, they will not say that you, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophecy, an unbeliever or outsider who enters the, uh, is reproved by all and called to account, after the secrets of the unbeliever's heart are disclosed, that person will bow down before God and worship him, declaring, God is really among you. Okay, again, to me, a little confusing, because in verse 22 it said, prophecy was not for unbelievers, but for believers. And now in verse 24, they're saying unbelievers will search their heart if they hear prophecy. Now, we assume the prophecy is in the vernacular, they know what's being said. And they'll search their heart and be brought to with the worship of God. The unbelievers in 21 and 22 were God's people who really had just refused to do what he said. They wouldn't listen to him, they wouldn't obey his language. Well, the, the people in 24 were people who had never been introduced to the story of Jesus, and they were converted by the prophecies of the church members. Now, let me add here, I. When I hear the word prophecy, I think it's some big prophetic thing that's going to happen that somebody's going to announce. Not back then, because they go on and talk about the kinds of things that fall under this category called prophecy. It's speaking directly for God, and it is sourced from the New Testament, directly from the Holy Spirit. Uh, prophecy can be predictions of the future, which is kind of what I always think of. Or it can be a revelation for God given through human messengers. Prophecy was a spiritual gift that could build up the church. But prophecy, interestingly enough, was tested by the congregation. Hang on. <laughs> well, I want this up and up, y'all. Uh, the judgment of the congregation determined the validity of the prophecy. I found that very interesting. If I told you I'm going to prophesy somebody, something, then you as my congregation would get to make the decision about, or the judgment about whether what I said was in fact from God and was a prophecy. And it appears from other things Paul said, everybody wanted to be a prophet. Everybody was wanting to get up and do their thing. <coughs> So, <laughs> I'm not seeing any of y'all jump up yet, but still, <laughs> that was what was going on. Okay, finally, Paul describes the process of orderly worship, a way that all can be heard and that all can be uplifted by worship. Well, I would say we have taken that to uh, its final point. We have a very orderly worship in this church. Uh, people do not jump up in the middle of church. They may say an amen, but quietly. <laughs> and they may applaud, which the ministers don't really want you to do, but sometimes you're kind of moved and short of jumping up and screaming amen, that may be better, so that happens. But 
Paul said orderly worship is best. And remember, we're in the first, the first century, and so he's trying to get them into a, a, a order or a mood or a mode to work. This is 1 Corinthians 26 through 33. It says, what should be done then, my friends, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all the things be done to build up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be only two or three at the most, and in each turn, and let one interpret. <coughs> But if there is no one to interpret, let them be silent in church and speak to themselves and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to someone else sitting nearby, let the first person be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may, be, all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. Well, I, I like that order. I thought, gee, this reminds me of high school. <laughs> you know, when we talked, everybody can talk. Just raise your hand, please, and I'll call it. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't blurt out, please, please. please. <laughs> you know, now, that's the perfect classroom where they did that, and it didn't always happen. And I'm guessing in this church it might not have always happened either, but maybe. Others can react after you've spoken, but let them speak. Don't deride them. Don't ridicule them. Listen and see what you think. And you can respond, you know, in order. And he doesn't want 15 people speaking in tongues one after the other. That gets old. Two or three. And did you notice when he talks about prophecy, he mentions a lot of things, a hymn. Someone could write a poem or write a hymn or bring some kind of revelation. Even speaking in tongues, he kind of put over there under prophecy. Uh, need an interpreter. But the group decides how valid everything is. I thought that was amazing. Because how would they know? I mean, you know, things had not been written and certainly they had, didn't have the old the New Testament. So it was kind of interesting to me. Uh, the early churches were probably kind of ha uh, haphazard, uh, you know, with, before Paul got a hold of them. If you think about it, everybody wanted it. And they were probably excited. You know, this was new and this was important. And they were probably excited. But if everybody's going off at once, nobody knows what's happening. So Paul was trying to straighten all that out. Paul was presenting the ideal and the church was to work toward that. But at every step of the way, he mentions the unbelievers and the people that have come, and everybody should be able to understand, and everybody should be made a part of the church. So I think that is the real lesson. It's just not for us and our little friends. It's for anybody that walks in the door, and they need to know what's going on, need to explain it and make it clear. Uh, my thought from this lesson was that worship must include all who are present and that worship should work for the good of all worshipers. Age, class, intellect, wealth, etc. These things should really not matter. Everyone should be taught, listened to, encouraged, made to feel a part of the group and learn from what the other worshipers have brought to the group. I thought I think uh, at one time in this class, uh, Logan mentioned that they had some people from a community, developmental community, had started to come. And they were made to feel welcome, so more came. And it was kind of overwhelming the little class they were in. So, brilliantly, they set up the class, and I know, uh, What's her first name? She's new in the church. Lemons uh, M came, and she she had worked with uh, developmentally challenged students before. She's a nurse, but she was willing to take over the class. We've had I don't know how many of that class and that group join our church, be baptized, welcomed with open arms. I mean, I I watched. You know, I can see everything from in the choir loft. And, you know, they're sitting on the first and second row and are so attentive. 
And I think with Dr. Head's sermons, they and, and probably the class too, I know, their Sunday school class, they learn everything, they understand everything, and it has just been pleasure to watch what is going on. Our church did not shun these people. Our church did not say, oh, you know, we really can't accommodate. Oh, they just changed things and made it work for them. And I thought that was such a great example of Paul's lesson. Uh, I took the good good example. Anybody have some more? <laughs> have we ever made anybody feel less than in our no. church? No. What I was going to add about that story, yeah. one young man came <coughs> from, I think, just people, and he started bringing people. Yeah. And he would take them up to joy. And I mean, it was really a, an amazing story. Yes, so. it was. It really was. And it turned out so beautifully. Yeah. So beautifully for everyone involved yeah. everyone involved any other comment on welcoming and opening our arms to people i don't think we're going to immediately see prophecy or speaking in tongues uh, in, in here <laughs> i don't know unless bill's gonna thank <laughs> for us or i don't know <laughs> maybe no. not no. nobody else i have so yes ma'am uh, you know years ago there was a split in the church because of speaking in tongues so I wrote in my Bible, and I don't know where it came from, but anyway, some have, no, I haven't, nobody must. So that kind of covers it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And my neighbor that. did speak in tongues, but it was, she said, it's very well educated Episcopalian, that it was a praise language for her. Yes, yes, it is a prayer. Yes, sir. Ever repeat what you said? Like, well, she she said what well, this church, uh, the Baptist church, I think she split over the the speaking in tongues. But she had a neighbor who did that, who was an Episcopalian, very well educated, and she said her speaking in tongues was a praise for herself, which is a, again kind of what Paul is saying. There's no point in you speaking. He said, "Go home." If nobody's there to interpret your speaking in tongues. You know, you're not doing anybody any favors. You're not helping. You need somebody to interpret. And, you know, I, I guess the, the nomination is changing. When I read that about uh, 2015, accepting ministers who said at some time in their life they had spoken, to, or missionaries had spoken in tongues, they didn't immediately toss their uh, application out. And I don't think that means that people who do that do that every week every day. I, I just don't know, but it was an interesting concept that Paul was presenting to these people. Essentially, not that it was wrong, it was good. He called it a, a spiritual gift. Mm -hmm. Just make sure somebody can interpret for you, because you don't build up your little church by doing things nobody can understand. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Well, yes, ma'am. Just maybe Speaking in tongues, when I first heard that, I thought that meant people speaking gibberish that didn't mean anything at all. But this means they're speaking in their own particular language, like French or Greek or, or Well, Latin sometimes or not, I understand. Yeah. Sometimes it is something that comes to them mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit, according to Paul, and it may be something that they don't even understand. Mm -hmm. And it said in there, you need to be able to interpret it or somebody else should be able to. But I, it is not gibberish, and I know what you're saying, because I thought, oh, people just start babbling or something. No, it is a prayer that you make to God. But if you can't get it interpreted, he's saying, go home and do that. I mean, that's for you. Okay. So that makes sense. <laughs> I was thinking of another maybe a silly example but you know people up north say you guys yeah we came to kentucky and they say you all we moved to memphis and they say you ones you <laughs> now I, i'm from that area of memphis I <laughs> we said y'all well it was north carolina where they said you ones yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 and jim thought they were talking about onions <laughs> They were speaking in their tongue. <laughs> oh, but I, that would seem to me, I don't know about y'all, y'all, I, I don't want those accents to leave. I, I think it's nice to have those regional accents. I really like to hear that. You can listen carefully. 
<laughs> figure out eventually what they were talking about. Okay. Yes, Dave. Um, I had an uncle who said up there instead of up there. Well, you know, so I don't know. Nobody else in the family said that, but I don't know where it came from. <laughs> but oh, someone told me they used to say, uh, get out and come on in. And it went back to get down out of the wagon and come in. Oh, but they said in these small towns, a lot of people would still say, well, get down and come on in. <laughs> they're, not, they're getting out of the car. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think Paul's talking about that, y'all. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any more comments? No prophecies. Yes, ma'am. Well, in that church, was um, it was singing, and then this one woman just stood up and started talking where you couldn't understand, and no one interpreted. It was I wasn't used to it at all. So. <laughs> Paul's probably right. It didn't uplift you in any, in any way. I mean, it may have been her prayer, but nobody could interpret it for her. Or she obviously couldn't con interpret or she didn't. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, but next time you get in the church and they're speaking in tongues, listen for the interpretation. <laughs> See if you get one. <laughs> I don't think I helped you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, what am I saying, then, is that... Uh... It's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bothers me. It's the things in the Bible that I do understand and don't do. You know, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. I just, yeah. I do. and I can assure you, speaking in tongues is one of the things I do not understand, and it never brings me closer, you know, to the Lord. I'll, I'll just say that, you know, but I'm not saying it's, you know, but it just seems to be very divisive. You know? Well, and that's just one yeah. of the things, you know, in the Bible that I just, don't understand, and you know, I've been around people that say they're speaking in tongues, you know. But, uh, but I try to concentrate on the things that I know that I should do that would make me a better Christian or a better person. But now, yeah. well, I, it's interesting to me because when I've always thought of speaking in tongues, I never thought interpretation went with it. Yeah. And that's what Paul is saying. So possibly if we heard it, and somebody interpreted it for us, it might make some sense to us. But in point of fact, it is a prayer that that person is making to God. So they don't have to do it publicly. No. Now, I never knew that it was a prayer. Well, I didn't either until I learned. See, it's like I learn something every time I try to teach this. A praise. A praise. Praise. A praise. A praise. Well, it's an interesting topic. The point of the whole thing, though, don't forget, y'all, it's not what's your spiritual gift. It's that your gift shouldn't inhibit anybody from worship. And everything you can do, and most of those gifts should uplift people and should bring people in and should make them feel comfortable and uh, part, of, part of the group. So that, that, that was a good message. I'm going to close this with a prayer because I'm supposed to be in my robe over at the... <laughs> I don't understand. I know. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for our many blessings for this class, and for giving us lessons that make us think and question. Help us to always be open and loving and kind and receptive to people that come to our church. Make them feel important and a part of the worship and make it so that they can understand what we are doing. In Christ's name we pray, amen.